Well, she can do it sitting down with a handheld.
Hello, hello. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone at home as well. It's lovely to have you with us. And it's lovely to see so many smiling faces this morning on this beautiful sunny Sunday. And it's lovely to have our choir with us. Um, always boosts our singing. So we begin our service this morning. Um, in fact, I'll say the first part. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we begin with our first hymn, number one Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the commandments which God has given to his people and examine your hearts. 
I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Amen. Lord, have you shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not dishonor the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit a murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything which belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your Son battled with the powers of darkness and grew closer to you in the desert. Help us to use these days to grow in wisdom and prayer that we may witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we sit for our first reading. Romans 10, 8b to 13. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. What does scripture say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord for all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, 
shall be saved. Thanks be to God. So we stand to sing together our second hymn, Lord Jesus, think on me and purge away my sin. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him, until an opportune time. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. your word in scripture. May we hear your word now. 
Amen. Well, I know, I know uh, our minds are very much taken up with the story of all that's unfolding in Ukraine, and we have wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So uh, uh, forgive me for using an illustration that came to me when I was listening to the radio, and they were talking about Stinger missiles. We're now all experts on these things. Stinger missiles are shoulder-mounted, and you shoot it at an aeroplane, and it locks onto the target, it acquires the target, and then the missile will follow the aeroplane. And the Ukrainians have had some of these. And I think that's an illustration of some, a, diff, a distinction I want to make between temptation and testing. The missile needs to lock on. It needs to be going in the right direction, and after that it can course correct. And the, New Testament uses a word that can be translated either as testing, if God does the testing, or tempting, if Satan does the testing. Temptation, sorry, te temptation. And so what I'm saying is I think here, when we read this story, we're talking about the initial orientation of Jesus in his identity and mission, the first launch, so to speak. Not all those little course corrections that we'll have to follow. We're used to thinking about temptations of little course corrections, small moral choices. But the first choice is the biggest choice, the choice about the testing. Which direction is the missile going to be fired? Which direction, which are the big principles of our life? And then the rest follows thereafter. And so we have Jesus here in the wilderness for 40 days. Let's just say he's in the right place. Sometimes we say we fall into wrong choices because we're with the wrong people in the wrong places. And we'll come back to that. But here Jesus is taken to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit in obedience to God's will. He is in the right place and he's preparing for what lies ahead of him. And so the first choice enters in that moment of, we might say, physical weakness. The first choice is about whether the stones lying on the ground, he should turn into, a, into bread. His point of entry is, and Luke tells us this, is that he is hungry. And here is something that could alleviate that hunger. His point of entry, the point of entry of the testing, the temptation, is hunger. We were watching Hamilton on the screen last night and we're going to follow the story of Alexander Hamilton uh, Monday by Monday in the Lent course. Hamilton commits grave moral sin because he is in the wrong place in one sense, but most particularly he is alone and tired. So the first question that Jesus faces, where is my will when my body beckons. Because being human, Jesus and ourselves, we have, at the very base level of our being, physical needs. And then being social animals, we have emotional, relational needs. And some of those things can only be satisfied by God. But the temptation is to look for all our satisfaction in the people and the things around us. The prelude to the fate falling of Hamilton in the story is his saying, I am never satisfied. He's always looking for more. He was looking for things that we look for, popularity and respect and fulfilment. And we know also people look for fulfilment, comfort and security in that category substances, whether it's drugs or alcohol or other things, all sorts of addictive behaviours. But Jesus says to his tempter, we do not live by bread alone. He doesn't say, I don't need bread, but he says, I don't live only by bread, but by the word of the Lord. 
Though without wishing to overplay this card, I think we do say something about Jesus goes to Scripture to learn what is eternally true, to being what God's way with him is. Now, in the secular world, they talk about you having a mantra or a script that when you fall into kind of mental confusion (coughs) or problems, you are able to say. And in a sense, this is what Christians have been doing. When we've turned to familiar scriptures like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Whenever I walk through the valley of the shadow of evil, death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are there with me. Whether it's that one that often I trot out, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Or whether it's ones like, I do not live, the life I live in the flesh, I do not live by my own will, but by the one, by Jesus Christ, who gave himself and died for me because he loved me. Galatians 2.20. We need to have those words, not those particular words, but words like those that are our touchstones that we go back to when we think, I have a need, but I should be looking to that need to be met by God. And here in Lent, there's a challenge to think about. What are the things I put around me for comfort and security? But taken the wrong way in the wrong time, our snares. So that was the first challenge that Jesus faced. Where is my will when my body beckons? And the second one, Jesus is taken in his imagination, in his spirit, by the tempter to a high place to see all the kingdoms of the earth. And at some level, we know that Jesus' vocation is to be king of kings and lord of lords. At some deep doctrinal level, we believe that Jesus is the creator. Through, well, the one through whom the Creator made heaven and earth. So to, be, to have glory and authority over all the kingdoms of the earth is almost the right thing to be aiming for. But the tempter offers an easy way, a shortcut, the wrong means. Now in the world of morals and ethics, there's all sorts of hoo-ha and debate about whether the end justifies the means. And on the whole, largely, people, certainly when it comes down to their own way of thinking, can justify what they do if there's, quote, a good end at the end of it. Without pursuing this too far, we know that politicians operate like that. But it's fairly common for people to manipulate their CV to present themselves or add one or two extra things to kind of big up their insurance claim because the insurance companies expect that. To um, be selective in your online, online dating profile. And on it goes. People justify what they do because it's okay in the end. Now, I say this is complicated, but, you know, it's complicated if it's uh, the big moral questions like if uh, the Nazis were at your door, would you tell them Anne Frank was in the attic? Now, I know those are big questions. And I know there are trivial questions about white lies. But broadly speaking, for Christian people who believe in God, I don't think the end ever justifies the means. And so we think, like Jesus did, you know, it was a few years ago, people had the mantra, what would Jesus do in this situation? Or a better way of putting it would be, what would Jesus do if he were me in this situation? We don't say, I can see it be all right in the end and do a wrong thing to get there. And then the third challenge that Jesus faces, having wrestled with what the will does when the body beckons, And when a quick win is unethical, he faces that temptation that perhaps is the root of all temptations in one way, 
is what happens when the world revolves around me. Wonder why this test comes to Jesus. I don't know. But there is a sense in which he has preeminence amongst all the company he keeps, doesn't he? We know he's humble and lowly and, and all that kind of stuff. But he can outsmart anybody. Wouldn't the temptation be think, I am the one in the room and everyone should look at me? Again, that's a temptation that Alexander Hamilton had. And then say, well, if everyone needs to serve me, well, actually, God, God's my little helper too. I can do what I like and God will bail us out. God's there for me whenever I need him. He's promised to answer my prayers, to sort things out. He's bound to help. Surely, that's the way that the devil's temptation goes here. But we need to accept, as Jesus did, not only in this moment, but through his life, that there are other things afoot in the kingdom of heaven. And not always our best interests are God's ways. Not always the things that I think, well, they're obviously right, are right from an eternal perspective. And that's not easy. There are 40 something chapters of Job wrestling with this question. But in the end, Job has to say, after he has seen God, God is God, and I am Job, and I have to simply accept that. That's the story that goes on in Psalm 73. All these good people are doing wonderful things, and I'm not getting anywhere. And Psalm 73 says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Truly you set them in a slippery place. You made them fall to ruin. This was the vocation Jesus had to accept. That he could snap his fingers in one sense and sort everything out. But he had to move day by day, yard by yard, towards the cross. Not everything was going to be sorted out because he was the centre of the world and everything would fall into place around him. And day by day, yard by yard, Jesus does not fail the test. And that's where I think we need to exit this story and say that that's where it's true for us. If you read Matthew's account of the temptations, the testing, there's a sense in which that was a done deal. The battle was fought. It's over. But Luke, I think wisely, portrays it as more open-ended. The tempter goes away for a time. Even on the cross, Jesus will be spoken to in these terms. If you are the Son of God, that question lives with Jesus every day. And he says, I am, but I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to demand God acts to sort things out here and now. And we stand in Jesus' shoes. He has walked this path. He has changed history to the extent that we need not be defeated by these temptations. The temptations to give in against our better judgment to our physical nature. The temptation to say, it doesn't matter what I do now if the outcome is good. The temptation to stamp our foot and say, why doesn't God do this for me now? Jesus says, you don't need to go down those dead ends. Rely on God's word. Develop a character that goes God's way. Have a faith that gives God his worth. Shall we pray?
Father, we read in Scripture that in Christ we are more than victors. Help us to live in the light of all that Christ has done in his life, death and resurrection. To trust you that we need not be defeated. We need not be downcast. But by the power of the Spirit, we can live in the way that Jesus did. Confident in you, trusting and faithful, looking outwards and thinking of others' needs. Work in us that work so that we are like Christ. Amen. We're on page eight. Let us stand to declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you like to sit or kneel? And Janet's going to lead our intercessions. In our prayers today, the response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. O oh Lord and Father, we bring our prayers to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. At this time of crisis, when Russian aggression threatens the peace and stability of Eastern Europe and the Ukrainian people are suffering great hardship and danger in protecting their homeland, we look to our leaders in the church and state to stand firm and speak out against injustice. Strengthen your Archbishop Justin, our Bishops Sarah and Graham, and here to Derek, Jackie and Julian, our clergy at St. James's. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give wisdom, patience, and courage to world leaders, our partners in NATO, and the United Nations, working to find a non-military solution to this tragic situation. May we recognize and accept that effective influence through sanctions will come at a cost to us all. During this present crisis, our concern for global warming has suffered a setback. Agreed plans, targets, and timetables are at risk of delay or failure. We may never be able to recoup our lost progress. We pray that we will manage to keep this work alive during these dark days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our own communities gradually learn to live with COVID, we think of the many lives permanently altered by the pandemic. We remember families 
who've lost loved ones, the people suffering long-term ill health from COVID, and people who have been unwilling to seek or unable to receive the medical support and care they could benefit from. We give thanks for the work of healthcare staff and organizations who risk their own safety and the health of their families to care for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We think today of those who have died recently, those known to us in our own hearts. May they enter into the eternal rest in your kingdom. We call to mind those whose anniversaries fall at this time. Lionel Mills, Daphne Burden, Monica Heaford, Neil Silver. May we come to share with them your eternal life. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Janet. Shall we stand to share the peace? Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Offer one another a sign of peace. So we join together in singing our third hymn, Oh, for a closer walk with God.
with this bread that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. With this wine that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. Bread for his body, wine for his blood, we shall remember Jesus. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these 40 days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again through fasting, prayer, and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendor of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and singing. We continue on page 14. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord.
accept through him, our great high priest, this, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, so in faith and trust we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
pray. Lord God, you have renewed us with the living bread from heaven. By it, you nourish our faith, increase our hope, and strengthen our love. Teach us always to hunger for him who is the true and living bread, and enable us to live by every word that proceeds from out of your mouth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We say together, thanks be to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits which you have given us, for all the pains and insults which you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.